When was the last time you felt like you could use some guidance? Or have you ever looked at the world and felt like you couldn't quite make sense of it all? Or have you ever doubted God's goodness in your life when life felt so unfair? Well, if that's you or ever has been you, then you are in good company because the writers of the Psalms were often in that place. And Psalm 73 that we're gonna reflect on together today may be one of the best examples. It's raw and it's honest, and it serves as a guide for when we need wisdom. It's a prayer for when we find ourselves in a season of questioning and confusion. It's a prayer for when life feels unfair. Psalm 73 is known as a wisdom psalm and is understood to be written by Asaph, a leader of one of ancient King David's three choirs. Now, it's quite a long psalm, and while I won't be reading it all for us, I would totally encourage you to spend some time with it. And for today, I'm gonna to walk us through parts of Psalm 73, and I'm gonna focus on some of the main themes that we see here together. Now, personally, I really love this psalm because it's brutally honest. Asaph feels like he has been ripped off by God. And he takes his doubts and his confusion and he brings it to God and talks through all of it. And this psalm reminds me that God can handle my honesty and my questions, which means that I can vent out my frustrations and my questions with God. And not only can God handle my raw honesty, I believe that Psalm 73 shows us that God welcomes it. You see, the Psalms speak to universal experiences that we all have at one time or another. And what we see here is that the Bible contains within itself space to process our doubt, our questions, which is so profound and significant. Now, Psalm 73 is a beautiful prayer, and it's a resource for us when we're in a time of crisis, when we're in a, a place of doubt. And Asaph finds himself in a crisis of doubt, and he works through his doubt not by suppressing it, but by giving it voice and bringing it out in the open before God. And it's really quite powerful when we can fully name to God or to others what it is that we're feeling and to have our emotions witnessed and held. And Psalm 73 is now a sacred text for us when we find ourselves in a season of confusion or doubt ourselves. And the author here is describing an experience that he doesn't even have a category for. And I think it's fair to say that a crisis of doubt is like that. It's complicated. And Asaph's crisis of doubt it's complicated and it's based on his comparison with those for whom he sees life being simple and easy. And verse one begins with, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And Asaph begins by saying, surely God is good. He begins with a statement of faith that he's likely held for his entire life. He remembers that God's goodness has been defined by God's action. And so for Israel, God's goodness was always linked to the story of how God redeemed his people out of slavery in Egypt. And Asaph has believed that God is good to the pure in heart. But then he goes on to share that he's not actually sure if he can buy it anymore. Because God's goodness to the pure in heart is what Asaph is most struggling with and doubting. That if God is good to the pure in heart, things should go easy for the pure in heart, but they don't. And so Asaph writes about how he prays through that experience of struggle and confusion of doubt. And this is a beautiful prayer that is a huge resource to any of us who are struggling to believe in the goodness of God. Now, Asaph unpacks the source of his doubts, and he explores with us how to process our doubts. He explores with us what to do with our doubts. And so we read in verse 2 and in verse 3, he says, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. 
I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph tells us that he almost lost his foothold when he envied the wicked. He almost lost his foothold when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, what type of a journey are you on if you're slipping and losing your foothold? What kind of a journey are you on if you're using this kind of language to describe your experience? Well, you're climbing a mountain or a rock face. And so Asaph, he's describing his spiritual journey as climbing up a rock face. He's describing his spiritual journey as challenging and hard and requiring effort. He talks about how he he came to a point where he almost slipped. He didn't, but he says he almost did. And Asaph is describing his experience using this rock climbing metaphor. Um, It's like he knew his his climbing route. He knew what his next move was going to be, and then something unexpected happens, and he loses his balance, and he became disoriented. And the loss of his foothold is coming from he's processing why life seems so hard and so unfair, even or especially for the pure in heart. And this makes him feel like he's hanging on the rock wall and losing his balance. Essentially, Asaph is asking himself, if God is good, why is my life so unfair? Why is my life so hard? Especially because I've tried to live pure in heart. And he's trying to make sense of all of that. In verse three and four, he writes this, for I envied the arrogant, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. Now, the Hebrew word used here for prosperity is the word shalom. It's the word that means wholeness, abundance, well-being. And Asaph, he was looking at his world and he was witnessing people who treat others poorly, people who reject God and do whatever they want, not just getting away with it, but in his eyes, they are experiencing shalom. And he goes on to explain all the reasons it feels so unfair. He goes on to explain how it feels like evil is winning, and he wonders why he should even bother keeping his heart pure. He describes the arrogant and the wicked as having callous hearts, clothing themselves with violence, having evil imaginations and threatening oppression. And yet, they're free from common human burdens and they have all kinds of wealth and he sees them living with abundance. And then in verse 13 and 14, we read this. Surely in vain, I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Essentially, Asaph is asking himself, is it even worth it to be pure in heart? The wicked get shalom, and I get affliction. I get punishment. I get the plague. It's like he's saying to himself, I'm trying to center my life on God, and those who don't center their life on God, they seem better off than I do. Why is that? Have you ever felt that before? Now, Asaph doesn't tell us all the details, but we know that he's had some kind of a personal experience of loss and affliction that is now causing him to question everything. And he's experiencing something that he doesn't have a category for, something that's causing his heart to question what he has believed up until now. He's questioning, is God good to those who are pure in heart? And this is the crisis of faith that is in this wisdom psalm. And here's the thing, a crisis of faith and a season of doubt It rocks our world and causes us to question everything that we know. 
But what if the question for us could be, how can we move toward experiences of doubt as a moment of growth? How can we move toward an experience of doubt as an opportunity for wisdom? It's actually really unpleasant to grow, isn't it? Because it involves pain. It makes me think of when we were kids and we were growing and we had actual growing pains. And I'm wondering, could it be that when um, that we're in a place in our faith journey that we're growing and it's hard and it's painful, that that actually means something is happening because it's when things are hard and painful and confusing, that's when we actually need to grow in wisdom. These are the life experiences that require the most wisdom because when things are going smoothly and everything is adding up, we actually don't need a lot of wisdom to know how to live well. But it's when there's doubt and confusion and uncertainty in our lives, that's when we need the most wisdom. It makes me think of a quote that I love by a poet, Rainer Maria Rilke. And the quote goes like this, be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Essentially, this poet is echoing um, Asaph, expressing a need to wrestle with the unresolved struggles and doubts in our hearts, even learning to love these seasons, these questions well, so that we can grow in wisdom. So the question for us is this, how did Asaph actually be patient towards his doubts and wrestle with them in order to grow in wisdom. Well, first of all, in verse three, Asaph acknowledges the source of what is motivating his doubts by acknowledging that he's actually envious of the arrogant. He honestly searches his heart and discovers that his motive, the core issue is that he's envious, he's jealous, and that's playing a role in his crisis. In your seasons of doubt or confusion, have you ever paused to consider the motivation causing you to doubt? What are you seeing that feels unfair? And what are you longing for that seems to be unmet? And then secondly, in verse 15, Asaph recognizes that his faith is connected to the well-being of the faith of other people, and that deeply impacts him, and it actually drives him to the temple. And it's at the temple that he he immerses himself in a community of faith. And there was something about prayer and community and learning and being with others that brought about a turning point for Asaph. He doesn't tell us how, and, and maybe that's good because there's no formula. And yet the key is that he immerses himself in a community of faith to help him process what he's navigating. He went to the temple and it helped reshape his mind, his heart, his life, his perspective. And the invitation for us is that when we're in a crisis of doubt, a time of confusion, rather than isolating and pulling back, what if we were to lean into Jesus in a new and more personal way? What if we were to lean into our faith community? Because sometimes others can hold on to faith for us when we can't seem to hold onto it for ourselves. I have absolutely found this to be true. And then third in verse 18, he writes, surely you place them on slippery ground and cast them down to ruin. Asaph realizes that the ones who made him question everything about God's goodness and grieve over injustice and suffering may actually be missing out on something that he's still holding onto. God's constant presence, even in the midst of suffering. He considers that everyone faces suffering at some point in life. And perhaps suffering is an even greater struggle if you're enduring it without an awareness of God's presence. So while it sometimes feels like people are getting on just fine in life without God, there's something about Asaph's journey of pouring out his heart honestly to God and leaning into his community of faith that brings him to a new place of inner shalom, inner peace, 
even in the midst of his comparisons, even in the midst of his life not going as he hoped and planned. Because we see in verse 21, the final thing that he does as he moves toward his struggle. We read this. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. It's at the rock bottom where Asaph feels God's absence. And it's at the rock bottom where he comes to the realization. He says this, yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds. Right there, God is with Asaph, holding on to him. God has been with him all along, and Asaph finds himself surrendering to the love and the goodness of God. Asaph begins the psalm by saying, surely God is good to Israel. His crisis then strips away his assumptions and his jealousy and his envy. And his crisis reduces him to being a brute human being before God. And that is the very place where he encounters God's presence in his life, which brought him to that place of dependency and that relational place where somehow in the mystery of all of that, he gains this new perspective and he grows in wisdom. And all of a sudden in this Psalm, we are overwhelmed with really intimate language that he describes in his relationship with God. And he wants to tell everyone about the one who is the strength of his heart and his portion forever. And so friends, if this was possible for Asaph, could this be possible for us? What does it mean to experience the goodness and nearness of God in the midst of grief and suffering, when life feels unfair, confusing, or incomplete? I've been working my way very, very slowly uh, through some schooling, through my Master's of Pastoral Studies at the Toronto School of Theology over the past seven years. And I'm now at the place in my studies where I'm completing a placement. And these days, I'm currently spending two days a week in that placement, and it's with Niagara Health, it's at the St. Catherine's Hospital, and it's in the spiritual care department. And being in that space um, is an experience that is very much stretching me and bringing me face to face with so much suffering. As I sit bedside with patients as they are dying and coming to terms with really difficult news and so on. And I've been aware that God is so present in suffering, so close to us, and that what we see in the life of Jesus is that he is always drawn to those who suffer, that he is not afraid to enter into that sacred space with us. And it's such a wild paradox, actually. And this paradox is most visible on the cross where we see Jesus giving up his life as the greatest and most eternal revelation of God's presence with us in suffering. And personally, I am aware of so much suffering around me in situations that feel unfair in the lives of people close to me and in our world at large. And at times, my heart feels so heavy and crushed. And I ask myself, where is the goodness of God in all of this? And if today you find yourself suffering, I want you to know that God is drawn to suffering, that God is drawn to the brokenhearted. And when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us, holding us close, comforting us. The Psalms invite us to 
pour out our hearts to God, to bring the deep yearnings and the cries of our soul to God, knowing that we are not alone, knowing that we can turn to resources like the book of Psalms to give us language, to guide us and to comfort us in our time of need in a way that brings us to a new perspective and a deeper wisdom in our lives as we continue to walk through the unknowns and the challenges of life. And this Psalm, Psalm 73, has now uh, become a prayer for us. And I'm so grateful that we have it as a resource and a guide. And as we close off, I'd like to lead us into a reflective reading of the final verses of Psalm 73 by reading them over, by reading them over you three times, slowly and reflectively, allowing them to sink deeply into our spirits as a source of wisdom for whatever season we find ourselves in. And so I wanna invite you to settle into a comfortable position to gently let stillness and rest meet you. Uh, turn your gaze a little bit inward. Close your eyes if it helps and begin to, first of all, become aware of your breath. And as you follow the inhale and the exhale of your breath, allow that breath to bring you into your body. And I um, invite you to allow that breath to allow yourself to drop a little bit deeper into the seat in which you're sitting and allow yourself to feel held and supported. And maybe you notice any places of tension or tightness into your body, breathe into them and let that tension go. Know that in this moment you are met with love, that you are deeply seen, that you are known, and that the beloved is here to meet you with these words. And I'm gonna read Psalm 73 verses 23 to 28. And as you listen, Allow these words to come as they will. Um, you don't need to attach yourself to any words. Just let these words wash over you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hands. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. And on the second reading, I'm gonna read that very same passage again. And this time, I wanna invite you to notice any words or any phrases that capture your attention. Any words or any phrases that stand out. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hands. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. And on this third and final reading of those same verses, this time I wanna invite you to allow the words or the phrases that have captured your attention to bring you to action. I want you to listen and notice any ways that you want to respond to these verses. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hands. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire 
besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds.